Well, welcome back to another episode of The Therapy Show. I'm your host, Lisa Mustard, and this week's guest is Richard Lang. Welcome to the show, Richard. It's amazing to have you here. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I also want to let our listeners know I have a special guest interviewer, my husband, Billy. So he is joining us on this conversation. So welcome, Billy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. This is kind of fun and weird at the same time, but I really think we're going to have an incredible conversation. The reason Billy is here is a little bit of background is, gosh, Billy, about two years-ish, you've been doing some meditation work and some things like that. And along your path of discovering more about yourself, you came across Richard Lang. Could you share first maybe a little bit about your story with that? Because I think it's really interesting. I think our listeners would appreciate it. Yeah. So I've been working on mindfulness, some variations of mindfulness meditation for two or three years now. And after trying several different guides to to help me understand it better, I came upon Sam Harris. And I learned a lot from Sam and I use his app. He's been a great influence on me and how I perceive the world and, and myself or lack thereof. And in studying with Sam, I came, well, first of all, I heard about Douglas Harding and the Headless Way is something that Sam talked about in his books and has referenced on his podcasts and different discussions that he's had. And then one of the interviews, so, so I was aware of the Headless Way and of Douglas Harding and, and somewhat detailed, not really detailed of what that was. I just knew that it existed. And then Sam had an interview with Richard and I was fascinated. And Richard's interview with Sam just really connected with me. I'll tell you, I've listened to that interview probably three or four times at least. And then when I found out that you were going to actually have a segment as part of his uh, meditation app, you don't know how excited that I was. And I really was looking forward to it. And it finally came about. And I've listened to all of them several times. And it's actually what my preferred method of meditation is actually listening to, to your program on there. And, you know, everybody connects to different things differently. For whatever reason, the headless way has really connected with me, and and it's, it's my best uh, resource. So I really appreciate you, okay. you sharing all that uh, with Sam, because otherwise I wouldn't know anything about it. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, and I wouldn't know about you either if Billy hadn't, you know, introduced me. Yeah. And you know, it's it's just amazing what people, what resonates with people and what connects with them. And would you mind sharing with us, you know, how you found the headless way, what your story is? It's, it's really interesting. I know Billy and I know it, but I would love our listeners to learn more about you and and how you got here. Yes. Well, I live in England. I'm in my late sixties now. And uh, when I was a teenager, I was interested in finding out who I really was. I was brought up a Christian and then I started looking at other religions, uh, which led me eventually to the London Buddhist Society Summer School when I was 17. And I was a confused, shy teenager. And one afternoon, Douglas Harding was there, who uh, wrote the book on having no head. And he did a workshop. And I uh, followed his instructions. I noticed I couldn't see my own face. Instead, I saw the world. And that's the experience of being headless. It's just your own point of view. And I realized I had found what I was looking for, my true nature, looking out of this single eye here. And I didn't know a lot about different religions, but I thought, this is brilliant. So this was 1970. This is brilliant. This is so immediate. It doesn't depend on anyone else telling you what is what. You look for yourself. You see your body's headless. You're looking out of open space. You're face to no face with others. It's a game changer. Mm -hmm. And I uh, got to know Douglas. I went and visited him. And I made a lot of friends through him. So really, since then, I have grown up with many, many friends who are aware of looking out of open space, being the space for the world. 
and enjoyed sharing it with them. And I committed myself really, or found myself committing myself to sharing it as well as just enjoying it. And so I, one way or another, I've devoted my life to it sharing the fact that you can't see your own face (laughs) you know from the outside it sounds so ridiculous but from the inside it's the way into endless blessings and that's for each person to discover and explore and Douglas as well as writing a lot he invented the experiments which are on our website and which are uh, ways of exploring whether or not this is true and what its application and meaning is. And uh, so that's all available for free on our website. Yeah. Yes. And we, I know we have done a couple of those experiments and we, we find ourselves sometimes sitting at dinner. I think, or was it this morning we were having coffee and I just went like this. Yes. <laughs> we just started You're- to laugh about it. Yeah. And I know people can't see what we're doing, but is it possible to kind of walk us through the pointing exercise? Okay, I think that would be helpful for people. Yes, well, well, I'll walk you through one or two simple experiments. So the pointing one is really drawing your attention, guiding your attention to the place you're looking out of, which perhaps many mystics say is is your true nature. You're not what you look like. You are open space. Well, how do we experience that. Well, I'm going to ask you, the listener, to do something very simple and very childish, <laughs> or childlike rather, which is to get your finger and point at something in front of you. So you've got to revert to being about five years old. <laughs> right. <laughs> and point at something and you notice that you're pointing at a thing. You can see a thing there. It's got shape and color. Now point at your other hand. You can see it's a thing. It's got shape and color. Now point back at the place you're looking out of, which is where everyone else sees your face. And if you're like me, I'm sure you are, you can't see your face there. And I say, I'm now pointing back at nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely clear and open and aware and full of my finger. Now I say that this, and that's it basically. Now I say this is a nonverbal experience. And so if my words don't fit, find your own. But another way of very simply noticing this is, are you looking out of two little windows or one single eye? And uh, just notice. And one of them is you take your glasses off or you make two, you know, a pair of glasses with your fingers like binoculars and you see two holes out there and then you bring them towards you and put them on and the two become one. And that's just bringing your attention to the fact that there's no dividing line in this place you're looking out of. And you're looking out into the view, which is single and fades out all the way around and is what you are. Yes. (laughs) And the other thing is, is when you look at someone, now say I look at Billy, I notice that I am face there to no face here. I can't see my own face. I see it on the screen. And someone else, if we were in the same room, would see us face to face, separate head to head. But my experience is head to no head. And I'm built open for Billy as Billy is built open for Richard now. So this is a very obvious and wonderful for relationships, seeing that you're built open. It's the basis of love, really. Yeah. Oh, wow. That just put a whole new reframe on our marriage. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. You know, recently, one of the things I've developed, because You can see this, but it is wonderful to have friends to share it with. And when you share it with others, something happens. It's a wonderful thing. And I've developed a kind of exercise where we share this together. So what I mean is very simple, really. You see, when you meet someone, you might share something about yourself. I'm in London and you're in America. And so there's an exchange of who you are as a human being. Well, why not bring in awareness of our true nature as part of the conversation? So I say, I'm, I, I'm in England, you see, my name is Richard. But really, from my point of view, I am space for the world. So now I'm just mentioning who I really am, and I'm bringing it into our conversation. And then it's a bit formal, but it just gets it going. And then you might say the same, well, I live in America, but really, I'm space for America. I'm built open, you see, for the whole world. That's who I am. And it makes a difference to actually say this in public. Something happens when you declare the truth in public. And then the next bit is to say, well, now I'm going to empathize. 
and I'm going to put myself in your shoes. Now, we do this all the time. You know, you might say, oh, you're looking tired or you're looking happy or, you know, you put yourself in someone else's shoes. Well, now I'm really going to put myself in your shoes. Where you are, you don't see your face. You are built open for the world right there where you are. You're this open space like I am. And this is really seeing the other person, seeing right where you are. You're not a thing. You're this open space full of everything. And they do the same. Now, you see that. Now, that is what we're doing here, really. We've got three faces on the screen, but we're all aware of one consciousness. Right. Oh, wow. Uh, that really yeah. me. I got, I totally get that. Yeah, of course you do. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it, it, and I know you and I briefly discussed your, and I'm just going to bring it in, but we can, we can talk some more about that. But it reminds me a lot of the, using the, the therapist as self in counseling, just being yeah. open to whatever the, pa- the patient or the client presents with yeah. and not having an agenda, just, just being present. And that's yes. a new way of, for me to kind of conceptualize that. That's wonderful. Yes, you see, uh, you, you use your true self. You become aware of your true self. Mm-hmm. And this is the basis of all good relationship is, is being yourself and allowing the other to be themselves in you, if you like, and uh, not playing games. You know, well, uh, you're, when you see you've, you're looking out of open space, that's the basic uh, non-game playing place, isn't it? it it's just, yes. Yeah. And of course, if you're in a, a I was a, a therapist for many years. I've just, to, you know, dialed it down really. But I didn't go around sharing headlessness unless someone asked for it. You know, they haven't come for that. Okay. But what you do, what, what I did, is you be that. You be the space for them, and you are, as it were, just as I have explained about putting yourself in someone's shoes, you recognize the other person is open space, whether they know it or not. So you you respond as that. And it is really supportive and not sitting apart judging, really. It's being completely on the other person's side because they are yourself and they, they are looking out of the same space, but into a different view. You know? right. Yeah. right. Oh, I, I can really grab onto that. Thank yeah. you. That's just beautiful. Thank you so much. There's nothing like, you see, when you're in a therapy session of enjoying being face to no face right. without saying a word. You know, it, it is a nonverbal openness and attentiveness now. You know, what, you, you can't go wrong with that. No, you really can't. That's a wonderful concept for the, those therapists like me who've been doing this work for a while. I think, I think maybe for a new therapist, it might be a little more difficult because you feel like you have to per, you know, perform or get to it. Or I think when I was starting out, it was harder for me to just sit and be. But as I've evolved and grown and yeah. done this work, it's, it's, it just kind of resonates so well for me. So thank you. Yes, yes. And uh, with the headless way, I think uh, you can't do it wrong. You get it perfectly from the start. Mm-hmm. I go around people telling people you're doing it right. Mm-hmm. Not you're doing it wrong or there's a bit more, you know, you've got it totally. You can't get the space more. You can't know more about it or less about it than someone else because there's nothing to know. Right. It's just being, you see. But as you live with it, and explore it, then obviously it it seeps in deeper and deeper and becomes part of your life and part of your relationships and your your way of being and relating. Yeah. 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 I was going to ask you, sometimes, you know, because for me, because it's it's relatively new, I have to remind myself to, you know, you kind of get about with your daily life and you kind of forget everything that you're talking about. And then I have to remind myself and then immediately I can snap right back into that mindset. Sometimes, you know, it's one thing, I guess it doesn't matter who I'm talking to, but if they don't know that I'm in that mindset and I just find it really, I start to laugh sometimes it becomes kind of humorous because they don't know that I'm thinking about them and the world in that way. And (laughs) You know, it's oh, a I have a friend who says uh, recently what he's been just uh, playing with is when he's out with people who have no idea about the headless way, he just he just says to himself, you do know about it. We've just agreed not to talk about it. Oh. <laughs> I mean, you know, but if you want to keep it going, which I think is where you were going, Billy, I think there's several things to say. One is that it is very comforting to know that, as you say, as soon as you remember it, you can snap back into it perfectly. 
Right. So you don't have to crank yourself up. You don't have to, oh, now what was it all about? I should go and read that book and really get, no, you just look and you're back. And that is not dependent on what you feel. You can do that and be depressed. Right. And, so, and I think that's one of the reasons that this method connects with me so well is because I can immediately snap yeah. back into it. Yes. It's, it's, it's available at any moment. All I have to do is remember my challenge is just to not get carried away with not, not carried away is not the right word, but just the normal ebb and flow of life and the interactions yeah. with people and problem solving and things like that. But just to have it at the top of mind because it's available immediately. And that's one of the great things about it. Well, you see, you're in a good position because you and Lisa are aware of this and it's infectious. And, uh, you know, somewhere or another it is in the air, isn't it? And it will, if you both value it, then that will grow in a very natural way. And one of the things that I have learned and understood is that if you want to keep this going, there's nothing like having friends who are right. on the same wavelength because it's like you know if you're if you love football you hang out with people who love football and that's all that you talk about you know well if you love your true nature and and being open and share you know being aware of face notes you hang out with others who are aware of this and uh it, it rubs off on everyone yeah right yeah, and, and it's so good to like, like Lisa has listened to some of your experiments and things that are available on the app, and then she's listened to interviews with you. So she knows what we're talking about. But sometimes I, I briefly try and just describe to my friends what's going on, and they really need to sit down and put a little time to do it because I can't do it. You know, I'm, I can yeah. experience it, but I'm not a teacher of it. No, and someone has to be interested. Otherwise, there's no point. Right. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, uh, probably all, we all have to work this out, is that the headless way is not a formula. It's not a belief. It's not a set of ideas. It's a nonverbal experience. So that takes all the heat off of trying to get someone to understand you or agree with you. I used to think that sharing the headless way was getting people to agree with my way of thinking about it, which, you know, soon runs into difficulties. And then when you realize that it is so simple, they can't not get it. And it is not a matter of thinking or feeling. You relax. Right. And then if there's a conversation, great. If there's not, fine. But when you say that they can't not get it, that's a, Sometimes, I don't know if it's they don't get it or it just doesn't connect. And then it doesn't connect. Yeah. Right. What I mean is when I say I had to work this out for myself, what is seeing who you are? You see. Now, if you put it in the most simple way, I would say it's noticing you can't see your face. Instead, you see the world. Right. Now, no one can deny that. So they all get that. You know, if you point that out, everyone gets it now whether they value it or another or not that is a different thing and okay. they may not value it and so then the conversation ends and i suppose you say you could they don't get it what they're not getting is what you get from it right <laughs> right yeah they're not getting the value of it yeah, and, I think, right. and i think you know but it's similar to your path of finding the headless way you know you tried a lot of different things on your on your search for seeing who you really are and you know you told you told me you tried all these things and then it was like you know rich, the headless way really connected with you and i know you and not billy you and i talk a lot about things that connect with us and things that connect with me and they don't connect with you and you know where i find my space and seeing who i am so it, it's or maybe i've just had practice with it longer that in my work, you know, people aren't going to always get it or they're not, they're going to take what they want and leave what they don't. Yeah. So I'm more at peace with that than I was maybe 15 years ago. And older and wiser like us all. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's what it is. So Billy, I know you had some other questions. Oh, I've got, yeah, I've got lots of other so questions, but just <laughs> along, along, along with that good. No good. is like, I've heard you say in the past, your job is not convincing anyone of anything. It's like you put it out there and then they either take it or leave it. It either connects or doesn't connect. And I think that's so great about 
you know, the way that you teach, but it's also like a commentary on life. And for me, it's something that I've tried to keep in mind. It's like, just trying not to convince people, putting so much energy into convincing people of seeing the way, the world, the way that you see it, you know? And I, I know that in the past, that's one thing that I've done a lot. And I, and that's, it leads to frustration. It leads to, you know, but just, you put it out there and it either means something to people or it doesn't. Yes. It's a different way of talking. It is, you know, the one is trying to convince the other, which is uh, being a bit bullying in a way, you know, you could say you're trying to impose your view. I think there are situations where that is all right, by the way, you know, I, I don't think it's across the board, but in terms of who you really are, you, you can't, prove your true nature to anyone no one can see their your headlessness but you <laughs> you know right. when you look at anyone else you can't see theirs in that sense you see their head so it is really just your experience the wonderful thing of course is it's the one experience you can share you know i can't share my experience of mozart or strawberry jam very well with you you my green might be your red but my nothing can't be different from your nothing and there we come together here. Uh, but we then, that kind of deep confidence and understanding that you're home and there's right. nothing to prove. Now that is marvelous for oneself and marvelous in terms of one's you know, relationships and marvelous when you, you might try and share this with someone to come from not needing to in a way. The other thing is, I remember Douglas Harding once saying to me, Richard, you can't talk people's heads off. You can only love them off. Now, that is wonderful, isn't it? You, that you Right from before you said a word, love them. What does that mean? See that you are them. See that you're space for them. It's, right. it's, not, it's not a loving feeling we're talking about. Or even loving action. It's just, it's love. It's seeing that you're built open for the other. They are within you. You're empty for them. Well, you know, you, you probably don't have to say anything else, really. <laughs> or any, you know. The rest is icing on the cake. <laughs> so something that I've been thinking a lot about, and now, now we're kind of, yeah, I just wanted to get your thoughts on a few things, but they don't necessarily have to do with the headless way. It's just more about kind of my studies and trying to understand consciousness and what reality really is, you know, and, and I'm coming to you. Oh, good luck answers. with that one. <laughs> Here we go. Tell me when you've found the answer. I won't expect to call soon. <laughs> so this is before we get into that. One thing that I think is great in this mind, headless mindset is just as you notice objects in the world you become better at just noticing your thoughts and yes. your thoughts are appearances just like objects are appearances yes. and they they peer out of nothing out of nowhere and then they disappear back into nowhere yes. and it's wild you know it's yes. just just like i'm looking at i'm in, i'm standing in my workshop and i'm looking at this tool next to me and just my decision to turn and point at that tool that came out of nowhere. Yeah. I didn't think it before I thought it. And then we'll start talking again and it fades off into the mist and it's gone. And the fact that all of yeah. life is like that. And, yes, uh, and it's always been like that. This isn't somehow, you know, achieving some new state. It's noticing how it is already that it, my voice comes out of nowhere and the thoughts come out of nowhere. It works. It functions. Uh, the only thing that we've done is obviously we learn to see ourselves from outside and planted an imaginary head on these shoulders at the center and then imagined all our thoughts are here separate from the world and then it, we go a bit mad because we've got all these thoughts and feelings in a tiny space here separate from everything else well that that's okay we understand that that's convention and that's that works but the truth from one's own point of view is quite different that there's no mind here and mind comes out of here now that is so freeing and your mind is at large and uh, you're not bugged in the same way by things it, it, you might still feel sad or whatever but that flavors the world and not your true nature 
Right. And this is the door to creativity too, because you've not got a tiny limited store of ideas here. You've got this wide open consciousness that is so in irrepressibly creative and seeing who you are, your true nature is sort of tapping into that really. Do you have, or what are, what are your thoughts on memory being related to that? Like, yeah, things are given meaning to you based on a memory of prior experience. Like if you didn't have memory, everything would be experienced, but it wouldn't have any meaning. If yes, you didn't have well, a memory to draw on. You see, you've always been this space. Once you, when you see your, this space, you see it's timeless. But what happens in it changes. And when you were a baby, uh, you were this space, but the world that was in the space that you looked out on was not very organized and didn't really have very many memories, or not even language, right? Now, right, over right. time, you haven't changed, but the world has organized itself. And uh, it's got memories and it's got plans and all of that milling about. And, uh, at our, you know, when, you, when you're an adult, it's reasonably organized. However, in old age and dementia, it will disorganize again. <laughs> you won't. You won't. You see, so memory is all part of that kind of middle period, uh, which, which is wonderful, really. Uh, you have a thought on whether consciousness arises or if consciousness is fundamental do, do you have any thoughts on that yes, like yes of course it's fundamental i mean self-evidently it doesn't start and stop it is not in time and you can't prove that someone else in language but it's just self-evident and uh, the world comes out of it or happens within it or arises with it. But yes, that's a wonderful thing. You see, you don't begin or end. Now, that is a game changer. You know, the, the fact that you weren't born and you won't die. Now, that is, if you like, almost the most important thing. Everything else falls by the wayside. But you now live from that and start to celebrate that and bring it into your everyday life in a funny kind of way. Yes. Well, so along those lines, so I know when you point back at yourself and there's there's nothing at point zero, I, I like the layers of the onion analogy, yeah. you know, yeah. and, you, and you back it all the way up and there's nothing there. And that's kind of the source of when you look out on the world, everything appears from that source of nothing. Yes. But as far as our personal experience goes, we're biological organisms that have sensory perceptors, you know, and a, a brain that processes the world. So when, it's, I, I think the part that I've been thinking about and just trying to, and I know I'm not going to find an answer, but just a better understanding of is, you know, and those memories are assuming they're stored in your brain, you know, it all appears, but if you, if you follow what I'm saying, I don't know if that yes, makes well, any I sense think at that, all. I think the layers of the onion are quite a good idea to bring in at this point. There's, there's two rather useful ideas. One is space, one is time. The layers are space and the stages are time. So in terms of space, I'll put it as simply as I can. What you are depends on the range of the observer. This is modern. This is relativity. This makes sense. So what do you mean? I say, well, I ask who I am. And you say, well, you're Richard. I can see you're Richard. I say, well, you are 10 feet away from me. So I am from there. What happens if you come up to me? And of course, as you come up to me with the right instruments, I'm no longer a whole body. I'm just a face, then a patch of skin, then cells, molecules, atoms, almost nothing. If you come right up to me, I disappear. This is taking that seriously. I am at zero, and I look to see what I am at zero, what I am really, and I say, oh, I am nothing, full of everything. Of course, if you go away, I, as Richard, you'll lose, and you'll find the country, and then the planet, the star, and the galaxy. So all these layers are manifestations of your central reality. It's what you look like at different ranges, and you need them all. You need them all. And so the biological layer is as important as the solar layer or the physical layer. They all are necessary. Your being, the space, is not dependent on them, but everything else is. You know, So how you see the world might depend on the sunlight or the clouds or what you have for breakfast. <laughs> but any layer will affect what you see. See, so they're all important. And this is not denying anything that science is telling us. You know, the state of your brain will affect your mood. 
It won't right. affect your true nature. It'll affect your mood. Or the state of, uh, you know, the, the weather will affect your mood. Or, you know, it's, it's all dependent. Right. <laughs> you see, um, what happened when uh, Douglas Harding saw his true nature, it didn't come out the blue back in 1943 or something. Uh, he'd been studying this for 10 years and trying to work out who he was. And he wanted to come at it in a modern way. He didn't want to just take on another religion or philosophy that he had to believe in. And he realized that what he was depended on the range of the observer. And then one day, because he, he could understand that the nearer that the scientist got, the less there was. So it made sense that at center he was a sort of nothing, which fitted in with what the mystic said. But, you know, he couldn't verify it. It all made sense, you know, beneath the quarks, there's nothing, all, all, all of that makes sense. But he said, but I don't want to believe it. I, I want to know it. And then one way or another, he just looked, looked down and thought, whoa, you know, there's my body. And right here at zero, there's nothing. Right? So at the center of all my layers is this awareness. Now, then he realized he'd hit gold. And he realized this was a very different way of appreciating who you are and what the world is from the normal view, which is just objective. So he then spent another five, ten years writing a book to make sense of it. Because the thing about it, as you are discovering, is that it upturns everything the way that you see the world. And it raises more questions. It must do, because it's such a different way of living and of knowing who you are. It's so different from the conventional current view. Right. And so all these questions are good news, because they mean that you're taking it seriously, saying, you know, yes, but, well, good, you see. That's saying, oh, okay, you know. So, you, yes, how does it make sense in terms of science? How does it make sense in terms of psychology? And the, the other thing which I'll just throw in at the moment is the developmental thing. The way of looking at it through the headless way viewpoint, if you like, or my view, is uh, you see, when you see this, you see your, your space. And you realize, I've always been this space. It's not just happened. I've always been this space. I'm just noticing what has always been true. So when you are born, you were this space, but you didn't know what you looked like. You were pre-verbal. You were just seeing things from the subjective point of view. You're at large space for the world. Growing up is learning through language to see yourself through the eyes of others. And what you are through the eyes of others is a child with a head when you're four or five, you see. And you, you go back and forth because you're starting headless and you've got to learn to put your head on. You've got to learn to see your, it's empathy. You've got to learn to see yourself from the other person's point of view you see, and language supports that. So by the time you're an adult, you're really eccentric. In other words, you're out there looking back at yourself and you're denying your own point of view in terms of being headless. So the first stage is headless, baby, pre-verbal, not knowing who you are in the world. Second stage, you're learning to get who you are. And as a child, you know, it's just as easy to be a lion or a train as a little boy or girl. Right. You know, because right. you're not in a bo one box yet, but society won't accept that. You can't be a train. You've got, you're a little boy or a girl. So by the time you're an adult, you're now accepting what society says you are. And in a sense, you're denying your true nature. All right. That's the third stage. It's totally appropriate. But if we stop there, we're not uh, we're sort of uh, st stopping short because what you can do is reawaken to your point of view you see, and realize how different it is from the third person, everyone else's view of you, but not throw out what they say you are. You've got both. And that's the wonderful thing about the headless way. Some ways seem to indicate that in order to be quote unquote enlightened, you've got to get rid of yourself or, you know, repress your ego or deny yourself or say, well, the headless way says, no, just you don't try and get rid of your face. You place it, you see where it is. My face is there on the screen where it belongs at that range, you see, and in the, in the mirror and in other people, you've got my face now, but here I don't now. <laughs> and that is true maturity is reawakening to your true nature while being aware of who you are in the world not just at the human level, but at the species and the planetary and all of that. Right. 
Yeah, I, I, like when you talk about the four stages of development, and we have a niece that's just turning one this weekend, and just be the little she lives in in Georgia, so we don't get to see her that often. But whenever we're around her, especially when she was even younger than she is now, just trying to see the world through her eyes, you know, because she doesn't have a word a word for anything. It's just pure experience, you know. There's no necessarily any meaning behind it. It's just things are appearing and things are moving and light and shadow and but nothing you know once things are given words then they yes. kind of categorize uh, yes but uh, 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 because you're aware of your true nature this nonverbal openness and you recognize that everyone is this then you can nonverbally enjoy being that with her and that the thing about very young children is in a sense they take your face off you don't they? When you look at them, you're not there, you know, now I should be, you know, you're just given the freedom to take them in because they're just looking, you see. <laughs> like, you know, I, I, they're, they're not thinking, I wonder if my hair is all right, you know, or did I, you uh. know, did I, I don't know. They're not, they're just being open. Now, yeah. no, but now there's you no know judgment. what that's you like. Know that there's is no that, Nah, so uh -huh. <laughs> kind of. I kind of wish I had known about this when our girls were little. You know. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So for for parents who have little ones, babies, this is this is really neat. Oh yes. Yeah. And you see, it, it this applies in all kinds of ways. I mean, I touch the table now. You see, well, I've got this idea that my hand is touching the table, but you know, I mean, let's say I don't look at my hand and just aware. It's just a sensation and awareness. There's no dividing line, right? Now you're holding a baby. Do you think that the baby is thinking, oh, well, I stop here and mum begins there? No, the baby is taking everything in as itself without categorizing it like that. Well, you know, that is just, you, you know, that is so uh, uniting to see that this isn't a technique for getting close to someone. This is just reality. You know, the sounds are in me. There's all the sensations are in me. The taste, everything is at no distance here in this. Well, it is such good news. I mean, you, you can't get to the end of this. It is like a master key in every situation. And the world really has to wake up to this. I mean, it's true for a start, you know, so if we're interested in the truth, which we are. But secondly, you know, the truth works, happens to work better than the lie. And we want to get, you know, we want to move forward and, and have things work. Well, you know, the lie of being face to, know, to face to face with others doesn't really work anymore. It's a good convention. It's an important to have it, but it works far better when you see you're built open, you see, or you're still and the scenery moves through you. It's much more relaxing. This works, you see. So unless we, you know, dive off a cliff, well, I think it's going to catch on because it works better yeah as well and it's right. true and it's fun right. and it's uniting uh, with everyone you know yeah <laughs> yeah the idea that you're still and the scenery moves through you i, I try and remind myself of yeah. that all the time when i'm in the car and uh just driving and just that sensation yeah. is yeah and wild, you're, you're probably you know? a better driver because you're more aware you know, normally we, we've got sort of tunnel vision <laughs> and you're thinking about things but if you're aware of your single eye, like I am now, I mean, it's wide. And you're con just look at the view. I mean, the, the listener can do this. You look out of your single eye and look at the view. And it fades out all the way around into nothing. Now, when I look at one of you, you've got a boundary all the way around you. Anything you look at has a boundary. And it's inside something else, you know, the room or something. But the whole view, as I actually see it, fades out and it's not inside anything it's sort of hanging in consciousness. Now then, as you're aware of that, and it just gets vaguer and vaguer towards the edge, yet you are panoramic, you know? And so you're much more kind of aware and attentive in a relaxed, open way than if you're kind of tunnel vision. Tunnel vision has its place, you know? But this is also has its place for sure, yeah. A connection that I find pretty interesting is I don't know if you have heard of someone named Donald Hoffman or not, but he was actually Sam Harris's wife wrote a book called oh. Conscious or Consciousness. 
I believe. And he was someone that she cited in the book, but he's a researcher at, I think, uh, University of California, Irvine. And he has, I don't want to get too deep, but this theory where consciousness is fundamental and everything arises out of that. Like, you know, Einsteinian rel relativity, that was the base layer of reality where you had space time and everything arises okay. out of space time. But m modern physics is true, and I don't know enough to be able to explain this, but somehow through quantum mechanics is proving that, that space time is not fundamental, that there actually something more fundamental that space time arises out of. And, you know, you taught one of your experiments is time. And actually, I did it this morning, just kind of looking through some stuff in preparation to talking with you and just watching the clock. And, and it's, it's really an, an interesting feeling too. watching those uh, seconds tick away as things change around you. So you have this changing space and you have this advancing time. And we've all understood, as far as I know, that that's base fundamental reality and everything yeah. that we realize all of our experiences comes out of that that's yes. the base foundation but that there's that. but his theory is and not just his theory but apparently science is proving that there's something more fundamental that space time arises out of yes well i'll i'll just respond at the moment to what you said you see and what okay. uh, i say is that headless way is being a scientist Science's attention is looking at the evidence, isn't it? And then you, you know, you might have a hypothesis and you test the hypothesis, but you rely on perception, on the evidence. Now, when I ask what am I, I rely on the scientist and the scientist tells me that from that distance I'm a person, but closer to I'm cells and molecules and so on. And almost at zero, almost, I'm almost nothing. But what am I? What's, what am I at zero? Well, they can't tell me. But so I'll be the scientist myself and look for myself and I say, oh, it, it is clear, open consciousness full of the world. Now, then you see, you don't have to debate whether or not these scientists have got it right. You look for yourself. And that's the foundation, the headless way, is you rely on your own experience directly, not uh, hearsay. And it corroborates with what they say. But, you know, you can argue until uh, doomsday about whether the nature of reality. But if you just look, you're home and dry. And it, it, that right. then can spawn all kinds of theories. But the theories come out of the experience, and the experience is basic. And it's not divisible into something else. It, you know, you can't divide nothing up. Uh, it's not an appearance of something else. It is reality. And uh, the two-way thing, you know, you point out at a thing and then you point in, is two-way. You know, one finger pointing out at the world, one, the other pointing back at nothing. And that, as you were saying, when you point out, you see things moving, but uh, in, there's no movement. You're still, the world moves through you. And uh, when you point out, you see a face and look, point in, there's no face. Well, same with time. Time uh, is, is registered by a clock going around, you know, movement. Time and movement go together. There you are. Time and change go together. Well, look where you are. Is there anything moving? No. Well, where well, there's nothing moving, where well, there's no change, there's no time. So it is a very lovely way of saying it is I look out into time from the timeless. Now, that is a wonderful way of living, from the timeless into time. And Douglas Harding had a very funny thought at one point because he wrote a book on death. That little book of life and death. And uh, I think, I don't know if it's in it or after he thought, he said, do you know, he was a, he brought up a Christian. You know, uh, St. Paul said, death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Have you heard that one? You know, death. No. All right, well, death, where no. is no. your sting? You see, grave, O grave, where is your victory? And Douglas Harding said, well, after 2,000 years, we can finally answer Paul. You know, death is about two feet away or just there. It's not here. <laughs> you know, we've answered St. Paul. Oh, death, where is your sting? Well, yeah. there and not here. Now, it, wow, wow. You know, and of course, that's what St. Paul was talking about. You know, you're, you're tr and this is, 
No time. But you see, then you don't get into the fallacy of denying time out there. You know, there's no, there's, because there's no time here, there can't be any time there. Well, I, I love time. You know, it's, we, we, we were dependent on time for setting up this meeting. Time, time, time is fine. When you see you're not in time, time is in you. Right. Yeah. And, and where where I was going with the, the Donald Hoffman example is, so without going back into that, but he has this, it's called an interface Ooh. user theory that we, it's I've almost got a no like face that we user are um, theory. avatars. <laughs> I've got a no face user <laughs> theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm, well, what I'm getting wow. at is it's similar to this because wow. he, his, he is saying that your mind or consciousness renders reality. So that's why I was asking you. You know, if you if you talk to most modern scientists, they say that consciousness arises out of some brain process, some you know synaptic. Though there's all kinds of theories, but yeah. it, it's you know. Yeah, but the thing is, you see, no one has ever seen consciousness out there. You've never seen it sort of bubbling out of someone's head. Or when they look at the brain, they can't find consciousness. So, you know, the idea is, is a theory. Now, let's actually start with the facts. And the only place you find consciousness is where you are. You've no, you, you believe Richard is conscious, but you believe you have no evidence. I could be a robot, you know. You uh, you don't know for sure. If we want to go for hundred percent, ninety nine percent, of course, Richard is. But hundred percent, I I say you can't be sure. But the, you can be sure that you're conscious. You can't prove it, but it is self evident. Right now, you see, look at that and see what it is, and the whole world comes out of that. Now that is starting with the facts, living from the facts, rather than, uh, you know, we understand the value of that view and how consciousness develops. All of that, it, this does not negate all of that. It has its place, but it brings us home to the simple, beautiful truth of your own experience, which is always available and you know, who can really, can you really sort of live from some of these theories about consciousness? Oh. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't, right. but you know. So <laughs> do you have a feeling on, are we rendering the physical world? If at point zero, it's just our experience, our consciousness that renders everything. Like right now I'm looking at you, my mind is rendering you. I? No, I don't think it is. I, I wouldn't put it, like, but each person could put it differently and you will explore what that means to you. But I don't find my mind rendering the world. You know, my mind is part of the world and I'm looking at the world from this clarity. Now, I understand from the outside uh, that my brain will affect how I see and all of that, you know, so it's not denying that. But this here, it isn't, it, it isn't got any designs or isn't manipulating the world or it, it's absolutely out of the way, way and empty for it. And then you experience the world as it's given with all its complications. The void doesn't manipulate and change and choose and anything like that. It's honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not up to some trickery. It's straight. You can you what you get. What you see is what you, you know. What you get is what you see. I know. Yeah. No <laughs> trickeration. Well. But this yeah. does not, you know, invalidate all that research. Uh, uh, you know, how the levels relate to each other. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just trying to make the. I follow what you're saying. And, yes. and I understand. And if you don't, it doesn't really matter because what I'm on about is your own direct experience right. of yourself. Exactly. And it's nonverbal. And the listener will, you know, God, I don't know what they're talking about. It doesn't matter really. It's, it's froth. You know, look down and notice your body fades out above your chest. And that's what I'm talking about. Nearer to you than your breathing is this open space. And hopefully you'll connect with that as a listener and it'll mean something to you. And if it doesn't, it, it, that's fine with me. You know, you are it from my point of view. And uh, there isn't any uh, difference or I've got something fundamental that you don't have. That's nonsense. Right. Yeah. The, the, the thing about the headless way, you know, you circle around and you go off in all lots of interesting directions, but you circle back as soon as you can, really, to the simple nonverbal 
uh, experience of what it's like to be you. Now, are you are you behind a face now looking at these fa three faces on the screen, or are you built open? Well, I'm built open. And it, you rediscover it every time you notice it. Oh, wow, yeah, I see what you mean. Douglas Harding, you know, when he was about 80, he said to me, I was staying with him, and he, and he, he said, Richard, I've just discovered something. I said, oh, what's that, Douglas? He said, just discovered that I don't have a head. <laughs> well, that's what it's like. To, oh, my God. <laughs> yes, I'm, you, <laughs> Billy, I just... We're going to have some conversations tonight, well, I know for sure. <laughs> when you get home, it's going to be a wild night talking about <laughs> all of this. So, Richard, thank you for giving us so much to consider and to to ponder and to and to bring, you know, this view of you know being headless. It's just it's I find, like you said, just come back to it. Just just be open. Just come back to it whenever you feel like, oh, I need to go and listen to him say this again, or I need to go read that again. Oh, what did Douglas Harding? No, just come back to being the pointing exercise. Yes, and then that's, that's right. very helpful. Yeah. yeah. And if your listeners are interested in meeting others, we have lots of free Zoom meetings every week. And all they have to do is get in touch with me and I'll send them information. And of course, there's sure, lots on the website and the YouTube channel. I will definitely put all of that channel. in the show notes. I yeah. have a feeling you might be seeing us or hearing from us on one of your Zoom calls. <laughs> I hope so. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. We watch. I mean, I, del I delight to hang out with you both, and thank you for arranging this. And, oh, wow! Uh, thank so you welcome. for for coming on to the show and you know being being here. This is our first time doing this this uh, dual interview. This has been an experience, right, Billy? Yeah, this is <laughs> very <laughs> much not normal. But yeah, thanks a lot, Richard. It was well, really... three voices in one three yeah. voices in one consciousness. That's right. right? Yeah. 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 Very I mean, wild. how wild it's is that? Truly wild. I mean, it's, I know this is just the beginning yeah. for me, but I'm very excited to continue the experiments and to learn more. And, yes. and we will definitely share all, all of the ways to connect with you on the show notes. And thank you once again for being here. This has just been fabulous. Well, thank you. Thank you, both of you. Thanks, Richard. It's great meeting you. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Therapy Show with Lisa Mustard. I know there are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and I'm thankful you've chosen to listen to mine. Be sure to visit lisamustard.com to access the show notes and discover more fantastic content. And I'd be grateful if you subscribe to the show. Thank you.